So the transfer of respiratory pathogens is primarily accomplished through droplets that are emitted by an infected person and then either breathed in or ending up on surfaces and touched and incorporated into the body in some other way by, by a susceptible person. So let's begin by talking about the formation of droplets during respiration. So these droplets can form in different parts of the respiratory tract. So the respiratory tract refers to the whole system of your breathing apparatus uh, in, in your body. So that includes, of course, your lungs, uh, which uh, in involves a, uh, a network of passages going from the large bronchus down to the bronchioles and ultimately to the alveolar sacs, where the air is exchanged, uh, where the oxygen gets into the blood and carbon dioxide is picked up, and then you exhale. In the upper respiratory tract, uh, we have uh, of course, the, the mouth and the nose and the larynx, the voice box where uh, you know, sounds are made. Uh, the nasopharynx is sort of the region behind the, uh, behind the mouth and the nose uh, where the passages are connected. And in all of those different regions of the respiratory tract, when we breathe in, air is coming through in one direction. And of course, when we exhale, it's coming back out. And there is a lot of fluid in the lungs. So the uh, uh, airways are lined typically with surfactant film and mucus, which is a uh, thick substance we're all familiar with. It can vary in composition, but generally has some large macromolecules and, and in particular proteins that are called mucins, which give it its sort of thick consistency. There are also ions uh, such as sodium and chloride, which are dissolved in the liquid. And uh, even liquids such as saliva uh, in your mouth uh, have a similar composition, but less of the uh, sort of thick uh, mucin uh, proteins that I mentioned uh, compared to the uh, deeper parts of the respiratory tract. Of course, when someone gets sick also, there can be more uh, of the sort of mucus and phlegm that's generated to help the body um, deal with uh, the pathogen. So all those liquids and fluids are present in different parts of the respiratory tract. And so there are a number of mechanisms uh, which are still subject of scientific research and debate by which droplets um, are created and ultimately emitted uh, when a person is breathing out. So let's begin by thinking about such processes in the upper respiratory tract. So in the upper respiratory tract, we can imagine, first of all, that the passages have a little bit larger spacing. So for example, your mouth might be open by centimeters or millimeters. Uh, if you go uh, into your nose, there's, of course, uh, various uh, hairs and smaller structures, which are uh, often covered with uh, mucus uh, and, and liquids, which, as the air is passing by, could be uh, leading to some, uh, some, some, some breakup of droplets. Um, and then, of course, also in the voice box and other, other areas of the upper res respiratory tract. So the main mechanism uh, here for generating droplets would be the breakup of viscoelastic filaments in a fluid flow. So another word for breakup is fragmentation of viscoelastic filaments. And by that, I mean that the, the mucus especially is a fluid. So it has a viscosity, a resistance to shear flow. But it also can have some elasticity. If you pull on it, it can pull back a little bit because there are these uh, macromolecules present. So in general, we have a somewhat complicated rheology of that liquid uh, or that fluid. And a filament refers to the fact that those droplets can be stretched out, and as the air is then blowing past those filaments, it can start to break up. So this is our basic mechanism, and this is um, mainly going to be happening uh, while a person is exhaling, at least in terms of emissions. It's also possible when you inhale, there'll be some of those droplets created. They go into your lungs or, some, or get deposited on the surfaces and then manage to somehow come back out again. Uh, but certainly during exhaling, you would imagine more or you could uh, 
you could see actually that, that more, more droplets are created. So if we think of uh, some examples uh, of that, we might have, for example, when I'm speaking or, or breathing and my mouth is a little bit open, um, if I imagine drawing, uh, you know, kind of, uh, let's say a person's, uh, you know, lips and mouth might look something uh, like this. So I'm kind of exaggerating here. Uh, but of course, there's saliva present, and there may be little filaments uh, that form. Of course, we can see this. Um, and then as we're inhaling, and especially as we're exhaling, uh, then these filaments will kind of bend, and they can break, and there, some of them will be emitted. And in fact, uh, these have been recently visualized in great detail. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's, that's one mechanism. So it's these, these filaments of saliva in this case uh, could be forming around, I'll just mention this picture might be, for example, the mouth. We could also look at the act of speaking. We will discuss in, in, in detail uh, later in this course that the emissions of infectious droplets is very strongly correlated with vocalization. If you're speaking, there's many more emissions than when you're just simply breathing. And when you're speaking in a louder volume or when you're singing, that rate of emission goes up very significantly. So there's clearly emissions related to the vocal, uh, 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 the voice box and to the vocal uh, folds in and the glottis, which is the basically the, the, the voice box. So what that looks like is there's uh, if you take kind of a side view, um, there are these, as a, as a cross-sectional view, there's these folds where the air is flowing through, let's say, in this direction. And these are kind of waving together. They're vibrating with a frequency. Could be, for example, 100 hertz, depending on the, the tone of your speech and the type of vowels or, uh, you're, you're making or, or other, other sounds. And again, what we have is that so I'm here saying this might be in the glottis. This could be the vocal folds. And this is basically the voice box, OK, is more colloquial uh, term. And as the air is flowing through there, this part is vibrating. So there's some kind of like, you know, uh, maybe motion. I'll just kind of indicate like this, just that this is kind of uh, shaking and vibrating and coming together. And of course, there's also mucus and other liquids that are here lining all these things. And when those folds come close together, they touch each other and they can pull apart and again form these filaments that can break up and generate droplets that will be emitted of different sizes. Now, one thing to notice is the, is the length scale. So the mouth, when it's opening, might have a length scale obviously on the order of maybe centimeters, but more likely millimeters in the regions where there could actually be emissions of droplets. If we look at the vocal cords, that scale is also going to be millimeters, but when the vocal cords really come together and pull apart, we might be looking at scales that are much smaller than that. So some of these filaments that are breaking up could be significantly smaller. And so vocalization may lead to droplets that are, that are quite a bit smaller. In fact, in the case of the mouth, as I just mentioned, the sort of length scale might be of order of millimeters uh, for the filaments that are breaking up. And the size of the droplets are, might be on the order of, you know, 10 uh, to 100 microns, or even bigger, actually. In fact, it can even go up uh, to, to, well, maybe not quite millimeters, but in the case of, let's say, when you're coughing or spitting, certainly you are spitting out millimeters, but it could be even, maybe I'll put even here one millimeter as sort of a kind of upper bound on the types of droplets that you could be emitting. In the case of the voice box, our length scale is a bit smaller. It might be on the order of more like of 100 microns for these filaments that are breaking up. And the radius of droplets that you're going to form are going to be smaller, and they might be ranging more in the 1 to 10 micron range, or possibly larger, again, depending on the details. Like if you're coughing and there's a lot of mucus here, certainly you could get uh, uh, maybe larger than that as well. So breakup of filaments is a primary mechanism of drop formation, especially in the upper respiratory tract. Now, what about in the lower respiratory tract? So that's really referring to your lungs. So 
So in the lower respiratory tract, there is uh, significant evidence and also uh, uh, at least qualitative theories and to some extent quantitative theories showing that the main mechanism is not so much the breakup of filaments in a flow, um, but rather uh, the bursting of films of mucus, but in, in much smaller domains, where it's not so much that the fluid is whipping by and breaking apart the droplets, but it's simply breaking up due to surface tension. Just that, you know, it's, it's this instability, kind of like in a dripping faucet or a stream of liquid, when you start to stretch it out and let surface tension act, it kind of squeezes down, eventually wants to make droplets. So that's kind of the rupture of a film under surface tension is more likely to be the mechanism. And so, uh, uh, so this is kind of maybe more generally can be thought of as an elastocapillary instability of uh, uh, mucosal uh, films specifically in the deepest part of the lungs and in the smallest uh, passages, during, mainly during inhaling uh, in the bronchioles and also to some extent in the alveola. alveola um, during inhaling, that's when the breakup is happening and then any droplets that are creating, some may deposit in, on the walls of the respiratory tract, but some fraction of them will be swept back out again. So let me explain this a little bit more detail. I should also mention this mechanism is also referred to as the bronchial uh, film burst hypothesis. And I say it's a hypothesis because uh, despite the fact that there's been a lot of study of the droplets that are produced by different forms of respiration and some theoretical modeling, it's difficult to actually observe this process occurring, you know, in, in the body. Uh, and so it's it's still, you know, it's a hypothesis that people are still, you know, studying. So what we're thinking of here is if we zoom in to a, uh, a bronchial, which is, you know, a passage uh, that, you know, looks maybe something like this. So like a, basically it's a flexible tube. And the smallest ones of these now are getting down to the scale of hundreds of 100 microns or so. So we'll just kind of pick like a typical length scale here. If let's say for the radius might be 100 microns or less. Um, and these, of course, are lined with mucus as well. And in some places, there's a bridge. So it's kind of like there's almost like, you know, bubbles of air. So, you know, with sort of little bridges of mucus. In fact, you may actually have even some places where the, the passage during after exhaling is completely collapsed, and so maybe some parts of it are touching, others are not touching, but there's kind of these little bridges um, of, uh, of liquid or films, or bronchial films, that are they're kind of extending, you know, across at least part or even all of, the, uh, of those channels. Now, imagine we start in this situation and we start inhaling. And let's just say this is the direction of inhaling. Let's imagine that the alveola, which is, is kind of on the end of this, uh, of this tube. And let's, so let's see what happens if we start inhaling. So for inhaling, then the air is flowing in. And so the first thing that happens is that these, that these bubbles are going to start essentially, or, you know, the, the, this, this film is essentially going to be pushed. As that liquid is being pushed, uh, we have some flows occurring. There's some recirculation flows in there. Also, there's interaction with the elastic or stretchy walls, which are soft, of the of the of the bronchial, and so it can expand. So, if you go like to the next step, you may find as you continue inhaling that now this tube has expanded a bit. So it might look more like this, um, and then you know uh, this. Uh, to some extent, you know, this film would start to get stretched. Um, uh, 
And then at some point, as this thing is trying to open, it's going to, it's, and also it's under some flow, but it, it's going to burst. And this bursting, again, is not quite the same as this situation because the flows are much slower. So here, these flows are often at so-called high Reynolds number. As we'll talk about later in this class, high Reynolds number refers to sort of the tendency of the flow to, go, to, un, to become unstable and for inertial effects and momentum of fluid to become important. At the scale of the mouth or the nose or even the vocal cords, there can be significant inertial effects and very complex flows. Um, on the other hand, when we get down to the smallest uh, channels in the lungs, and especially when we reach kind of the dead end, you know, of these sort of the alveolus, which is basically like a bunch of little sacs, you know, they're kind of at the end here. Uh, then, you know, it's kind of a dead end. There can't be any like very fast flow through that, through that system. And so, you know, it's actually a low Reynolds number situation. So we're not talking about turbulent flows or, 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 or uh, you know, sprays of liquid at high Reynolds number. Instead, we're talking about films that are getting stretched out and then they simply break up under the effect, effect of capillarity, which refers to surface tension. So basically when you expose a surface and stretch out a liquid film, it just tends to break up into little droplets, basically in order to minimize its energy. So what we'll see here is that maybe one of these films over here has already burst and will lead to some droplets that are being created. So this bursting of the film is what leads to the droplets, okay? And when you're inhaling, those get swept, you know, a little further, you know, downstream. Some of them may deposit on the walls and go back into the film and coalesce into the film, but others will remain suspended in the air. And now when you exhale, you start pushing back the other way. The uh, tube is more open now. And, you know, we may have a situation like this where there's no more sort of spanning films left, but there's some fraction of these droplets. A few of them may have deposited and coalesced on the surfaces, but they're gonna start getting blown out the other way now. And so these are the droplet emissions right here. I'll just say it'll eventually lead to that. So some fraction of these will make it all the way out. Of course, those droplets can deposit anywhere in the respiratory tract. In fact, some of them, if you're breathing through your nose, may end up getting caught in your nose, actually. And so there's an exchange of fluids between the different parts of the respiratory tract. But some fraction of those droplets will get out. And then ultimately, when you finish exhaling, now the pressure is released. And this uh, you know, tube kind of relaxes back you know, to its original state where there's some mucus here and there's some places maybe where it's closed and there's kind of these, uh, you know, possibly spanning films in some places where the film is touching. So these are some of the basic processes uh, by which uh, droplets are uh, emitted. As you can see by the range of different processes that are, are possible in, in, the, in the human physiology, uh, that we've just described, we can see there's a range of droplet sizes that will depend on the respiratory activity. Are you breathing lightly because you're sleeping? Are you breathing heavily at high speeds because you're exercising? Are you vocalizing and generating droplets in a different way in the larynx? All those activities play a role, and also there are variations between individuals. And finally, if a person is sick, and all these fluids I've sketched here as mucus contain pathogens such as virus or bacteria, then of course the degree of infection, the viral load or the total amount of pathogen, the total amount of bacteria plays a role as well in sort of how infectious the emissions are from breathing. Uh, but these are some of the basic principles. And now we'll move on to ask what happens to those droplets after they leave the mouth of the infected person.